Okay, we're just going to go back over what we did the last time. You want to sit here? <clears throat> okay. Here's the question. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. <clears throat> How do you talk about a seed? That's all. Right. All right. A seed. How do you talk about it? <clears throat> now, in this beautiful diagram of a growing seed, <laughs> Notice it starts out, ain't doing much. So in terms of its activity, zero percent. By the way, as the roots take off, yeah. right? Hey. <coughs> 10% is used up. 30, 40, 60, all the way down to 100% is used 100% is used up. So we can work it backwards and say that in terms of <clears throat> what is possible, look here, what is possible. Well, possible as a hundred percent possibility of developing. Yeah. Backwards. How can you call that last one a hundred percent development? It's very uh -huh. What see the first line is <clears throat> how much is used up? Oh. Right? How much is left to do? Okay, okay. Those okay. two words have a funny and curious word in Aristotle. Right? The growth is actualization. What is yet to develop is its potential. Now what that is saying, isn't it, that when you consider a seed, it has a great potential to develop in all of the ways in which it can develop. This is a kind of motion. This is a kind of motion. It's growth. It's development. Agree? <coughs> yes. Now, if you go along with this, you can make a simple statement. You can say <clears throat> motion, in terms of anything in nature. It's nothing other than the actualization of what lies potentially within the seed. Agree? Yes. Mm. 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 sound. Say that again. I saw the problems of seas. One, two. <laughs> Sir? Um, uh, who does the actualizing? See. Nah. <laughs> now notice that. Nah. Flippant my answer as if it was nothing. Of course, it may be nothing. What? Well, the seed sitting on a sidewalk, for example, is not going to actualize itself for all about some, like you said, some condition. Help. But, but yeah, but look at given the right conditions. All right, okay, I got that. Given the right conditions, <laughs> it will mature in the way in which I have drawn it. Oh, was you, you said something about motion. What did you say? Now, motion is nothing other than the actualization of. Yes. Then, when you step away from and ignore everything else, 
<clears throat> you can say motion of any kind is actualization of potential insofar as it is potential. <coughs> right? That's an interesting concept. That's Aristotelian. That is, is that Aristotelian as well? 100%. Let me ask you, where is the intelligibility for the growth of the seed? Must be contained in the seed. seed. The full development of it must lie in that seed. Mm-hmm. A mighty oak from a little acorn grew. Yeah. But you're talking about a living seed. Yeah, right? that's true. Yeah. <laughs> not just a seed. All there. living things. Absolutely not just right. Just sitting there doing yeah, nothing. Yeah. Now, he will then extend it to motion in general. But at mm. first, it's all animated life. This captures all things living. So, like, my own motion is contained somewhere in the seed of me. And every motion that I do and trying to attain an idea would be actualizing that potential contained in that me seed or self seed. I now, <clears throat> we're lucky to have someone who is familiar with the creative processes. Uh, uh, did you drop a seed recently? No, no, come on. A seed. Same thing. Same thing. Well, what about like a planet? It's in motion. And the seed that contains everything. It just needs time to unfold. That's all. That's very good. Uh oh. Is there a discussion of what makes the conditions right, or is it just uh, Oh yeah, language? water and that kind of stuff, we throw that in. I mean by Aristotle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But essentially this is a... Okay, so there's not a... So what's, what are the arguments that are what against are... that? <laughs> Nothing, this is true. <laughs> well, I know that. But. but he can make this entire argument without soul or intelligence or good. Of right. course. There's no benefit. So, of course. So you don't need those what, things. So we're dwelling on Aristotle. But he, hey, that's absolutely the right. You don't need those things. Yeah. Matter of fact, for the idea of soul in Aristotle, all you need is the idea of life force. That really describes what he means by soul. It's a life force. Don't. Pretty, pretty inadequate. What's inadequate about it? Here I'm spending my time trying to help you understand something on a high level, and I'm getting nothing but scorn. So what? May, may the life force be with you. <laughs> That's it. That's right. That's right. The life That's right. force be with you. It's coming right out it of good old you know who. Lucas. So why are you telling us this anyway? Hmm? Why are you telling us this? Pardon? Why are you telling us this? I like to share truth. <laughs> okay. Because Plotinus uses the language. They go into. <coughs> oh, Plotinus. It may be an introduction. Into oh, okay. I don't care about the silence. Forget him. Okay. This is true. Uh, yeah, that's the problem. As David said, therefore, the ideas of intelligence and soul don't play only a minor I mean, role. I mean, this is the genetic theory. It's already theory implicit in the two. Yeah, this is the genetic theory in psychology, basically. Well, that's why they're true. Right. <laughs> It's about time psychology got into truth. 99% of them. Yes, it is. Psychology. Psychology mirrors apps Aristotle. Right. Right. Okay. That's all. That's the end. We change the subject now? Well, he actually <laughs> yeah. uses those categories of genus and species. 
Oh yeah, that's the easy. Minus, Everything should be in a class, and a class has its members, and its members the, also have a differentia. Yeah, so we can do away with forms. But Plotinus uses those same well, terms yeah. to develop the idea of being and existence. That's true. And out of that comes one mind, soul, That's life, because motion. Plotinus right. wants to oh, reconcile yeah. Plato and Aristotle. That's right. right. He does a nice job of it. Oh, some people think he does, yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend of mine who read it, and he thought so. Well, which part should we not read, and which part should we read? Well, look here. Um, uh, As if you keep the same thought we've been doing, these are the ten ideas that are primary in Aristotle. This is all you have to understand. These are ten ideas, and uh, he uses the word substance. Occasionally, he uses this word, usia, quantity, quality, relations, location, time, position, habit, action, and of course, uh, passions. These are the principal ideas, all you need to know. And see, you can use that language with this model. It's all in animate, innate. That's all. Oh, wait. Don't turn it yet, Pierre. Thank you. Think something of it? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. And then now notice this is a different kind of language. Um See, all of nature, it doesn't have an end other than the life of the planet. It doesn't have a telos beyond that. It's just living things go on in this way, and you can't ask what's the final end. He doesn't play that game. He isn't interested in that game. In the Platonic world, right? He's, there's an order here, there's a pattern here, it's well-defined. <clears throat> but it's going somewhere. <coughs> it's going to have an end. Now, living things have a center called the soul. Now, the development of the soul depends upon accepting challenges. And uh, they have to be a, a, a benefit. Right? Uh, look here. The development of the soul depends upon accepting challenges. In that way, it benefits. It benefits by being part of a caring universe. Now, how can you show that? You're stepping outside of the animistic world. So let's do that over here. Same image, same image we have there. What's the difference? He's saying 
that the intelligibility, the intelligibility of that pattern and that order comes from these things participating in a higher order, independent of it. Order exists. Patterns exist. Ends exist. And it's only by, what's the big word? Participation. It's by participating in this higher order that allows the next stage to emerge. This is the embryo. Birth. Development. What Aristotle did away with is the idea of participation. That does away with the idea of participation. It's inherent in the seed. We don't need the idea of participation. And why is it participating? Why is it participating? For what is all this participation in life? Where is it all going? <laughs> Same question. Why are we here? <laughs> okay. You're outside of the animistic world now. <coughs> For Plotinus and Plato, the same, the same thing is said. All that lies in the animistic world, the world of anim, the nature, all that exists in nature is a shadow. of the intelligibility of the self. For Aristotle, this is real. This is not a shadow of anything. This is real. This is the only real. This is the only real thing. It can be found in nature, study nature, watch its laws. That's all you need to know. Over here now, he's saying, look here, that whole world of nature is only a shadow of the intelligibility of the soul. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means anyone who now has grasped this idea may want to say, hey, then how can you see the real? Right? How can you get to know the real? Well, now you, now you have a different question. Uh, the only way you can do anything with this is to say, this idea of participation, is it possible that you can, you can experience it directly? Can this be experienced directly? Now, all of this in Aristotle, pardon me, in uh, Plotinus and Plato hangs on one word. Okay, keep in mind this one sentence, all right? All that exists in nature is a shadow of the intelligibility of the self. What separates Aristotle and Plato, Plotinus, other thinkers, is um, the soul is something that functions it's something that functions right in Plato 
the three parts, the appetitive, desires, and reason. In reason, there are the four kinds of cognitive activity called knowing, understanding, belief, and image thinking. None of this makes sense unless you have that one year unusual Greek word. There's something about all of this activity, it turns upon itself. Say, how do you know when you're hungry? I feel it. Yeah. You have the ability to reflect on your physical being and you recognize a certain feeling and you say, time to eat. Yeah. Right, right. Hey, uh, desires. Uh, desire anything you're doing now? You're trying to understand something? Uh, periodically uh, yeah, I take yeah, a sip yeah, of coffee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what are you doing when you're desiring? You desire something means you lack it, y yeah, and you want to go for it, uh -huh. so that you can then satisfy yourself. Right, right. So that means you have to have something in you that can recognize as a lack. Mm -hmm. You know what can, can fill it. Yeah. So these are secondary, secondary functions of usia. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? Usia means um. what? The ability of the mind to turn upon itself, to discover itself, and to know that it is. That's all. That's intelligent. That's missing in our soul. This is central to Plato, Plotinus, Proclus. Wow. Uh, it means we have the ability, the intellectual ability, to recognize we're ignorant, and we don't like being ignorant, and we seek knowledge in many fields, including knowledge of ourselves. That ability to recognize you lack something, hey, that you can then do something to recover it, yeah. That's the word. That's the power. Now look here. What the heck is this? Look here. See, there is something in us that turns about to yeah. discover itself. That means this is an action. This is a movement. That means there has to be a certain power present to propel that activity. But power needs energy as its source, right? So, in this idea of Usia, the whole thing is a movement on itself. There must be, therefore, a recognition of its object, whatever it's going to be. Therefore, that's the moment of insight. Now look here, see. What kind of insight are we talking about? On what level? Because this can operate on each of these levels. He's going to say, look here. Do it on each level. Because belief, there's a certain kind of reflection turning upon itself. It ends up with belief, but it's still a kind of activity turning upon itself. Modestly, understanding is better, right? For understanding, something you bring all the parts together into unity. That unity is a one. Ah, you feel good about it. You gain an insight into it. Ah, what about this? Knowing. For Plotinus, Plato, Proclus, 
This is knowing what truly is. Another word for that is being. What can you say about it? It is one being. What's it like? In the Republic, he says, that experience when you can really take a look at yourself, you know, this kind of knowing, this kind of knowing the self. is the most brilliant light of being. That's the mind turning upon itself, discovering its own roots. It discovers what is, truly is. That's called one being. But when experienced, that's also called the most brilliant light of being. <laughs> of being. Hey, this crazy, these crazy people are saying something real strange. <laughs> They're saying, this is really what's going on. If you're caught up in the everyday world, it's only a shadow. It's only a shadow. It's only a shadow of what's real. That's real. This is just a shadow of it. Now, at that moment of seeing, that's rest. So this whole thing is an example of motion and rest. It's a different kind of motion and a different kind of rest than in the everyday world the everyday world that's moving things around and keeping them in place. There's, these two guys are saying, excuse me, that's all true. But it's only a shadow of what's real. This is what's real. Curious? Well, I'm curious about the shadow of intelligibility yeah. issue. So, the that's intelligible, but it's only a shadow yeah. of a greater intelligibility. That's right. It has a low level of intelligibility. Right. Okay. In Plotinus, he says that movement is thought and rest is perfection. Yes. Which is because kind of both of these, see, at rest, that's perfection. You finally are seeing it. That's perfection. That's another word for excellence. Right? That's this is a moment of perfection. That's the, it was arte, yeah. What page is that? Oh, is that right? 131. It's in the Is that in the bottom six? No. Now you can jump into Plotinus, section 5, 6, 7, 8, any uh, part, part you want. And you'll see he drops out all the talk about species, genera, genera, species, bar pardon Generous species differentiate. Those are classes to put natural things in the natural world into categories. Now, where are his categories? See, in this brilliant light of being, that's truly what is. But wait a minute. When it's experienced, when that moment is experienced, it can take on various words that try to put into uh, everyday language, the content of that experience. Therefore, we can talk about, hey, you know what that read? That is, that's something that really is. Or being. Oh, no, oh, you're encountering what's ultimately real. Oh, that's the most uh, magnificent, most beautiful thing conceivable. Now these ideas, these ideas become the primary ideas in Plato's doctrine of forms. 
there are two levels of forms. The primary ones are what are the things you can name from that experience of the brilliant light of being. Second level of ideas are uh, relational terms. <coughs> relational terms are, is reality like beauty? Is beauty like uh, what really is? Look here, like or likeness, uh, unlikeness, motion, rest. Hey, all of these are aspects of one thing. They're all aspects of one thing, not three separate things. Therefore, it's a oneness, a unity, a unity that doesn't have distinctive parts. They're differences without distinctions, right? Because they're only aspects of the same thing. So it's a unity being a oneness. Right? So then you can talk about a whole. Right? Notice. These kinds of words are relational terms that are also called in the forms, but these are the primary <coughs> ideas that can be inferred from that experience. So you have two levels of ideas in the so-called doctrine of forms. Hey, what are their primary doing? Why are they important? Imagine if you want to know about excellence, you want to know about perfection, if you want to know about reality, you're now talking about a new way of talking and a new way of understanding, a new way of hopefully perceiving. That's what this language is all about. Aristotle, everything that he's doing is to make sense of nature. There's no excellence there. There's no good. No, this is all, this makes sense of the everyday world. He's not into the everyday world, it's a shadow. Therefore, he's saying, look here, we can make sense of the most profound experience any kind of man has ever experienced in the whole universe. These are the terms. This is what's going on. This is the reality. <laughs> So, now go back here. These words, potential and actual, do, they, they do not need the idea of participation. It's inherent in the seed. Here Aristotle is really building a vocabulary that rejects this. And, uh, it doesn't mean a lot of people want to use that language interchangeably, but they're bound to get into all kinds of confusion sooner or later, which is, I think, what Plotinus is doing. Can you flip the, that page just so we can see? Because last week you talked about this on the next page over there. You may be right. Mm. Is it? Oh. Yay. Good heavens, we did talk about oh. it. Look at that, she's so right. Oh yeah. Now he does have an end, that everything is moving by the unmoved mover. But that's Ar all. Aristotle? The yeah. Papa Aristotle. Oh. But it has no end, it doesn't have a telos. It's not doing anything for any purpose. Just an unmoved mover is moving nature. Oh, good. <laughs> I find it very interesting how, uh, even the, given the stuff that you talk about in terms of Plotinus, well, thank you. Which is really amazing. Even given the stuff you talk about in terms of Plotinus, it's amazing and beautiful. But there still isn't like a, a, a step to how to do it. It's just saying that this can be done. These states on the left that uh, Plotinus is talking about, they are present. In terms of, like, you can participate in Lucia and knowing yourself. But they don't really, like, actually describe, like, the practice of the philosophy that does that. Well, <clears throat> okay. 
What is essentially different between Aristotle's idea of the soul <clears throat> and Plato or Platonus? <clears throat> Are you asking me? Yeah. So, okay. his is still trying to make sense of the, the physical life of man. Mm -hmm. What he doesn't accept for him, there is no possibility of any separation of the soul from the body. Hmm. More booze, yeah. That's all. That's the end. In Plato, in Plato and in the Phaedo, there's a yoga on how to separate the soul from the body so that it can experience this world. So you either decide to go along with it or you don't. And even then, some then comes, somebody comes to a state of knowing and then they fall out of that into beliefs and image thinking and they have to go through understanding. And then it doesn't still seem like... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Fall out of under, fall of out of knowledge. Yeah. How do what? you do that? Oh, wait. Could you start again? I was. No. Okay. Watch. <clears throat> when we're using the word knowledge, we only mean knowledge of this. That's all. Okay. So that state seems to come and go sometimes. I mean, uh, in terms of really? yeah. In it. Yeah. But it depends on what you do with it. In meditative systems like Buddhism and other kinds of yoga, they say after this experience you have to keep sitting. Right. Or it will only be a memory after a short while and it will lose its power. I think what I'm really intrigued in is by doing dream work, we actually see in our own experience the process that we go through to come oh. through knowing oh. and the telos that we're being brought to. Like you've actually introduced the idea of the destiny of man, and Quite then how going into your problems and reflecting on them is a part of manifesting that participation in mm -hmm. the intelligibility. That's right. So I was thinking almost without your work, not to compliment you, but without your work, then it seems like even then this is just like, yeah. hey, look what man can do. Yeah. Now good luck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like go for it. Yeah. Whereas there's no method. And daydreams. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like, <clears throat> how many of you have seen either yourself or others <clears throat> go through dreams that are very profound, that enter into very profound states of mind? Right? Hey, if you don't pay attention to your dreams, you're missing out on a vital aspect of the nature of reality. Because every dream is recursive. We see it. Yeah. How, how so? Well, what, how would you describe what we were doing today with dreams? Well, what we're doing today with dreams, but every dream is recursive. Are you, are you saying that the dream is recursive within itself or only when we get out and look back on it? Dream. What do we do in a dream? What? Uh, what do we do with uh, Belinda's dream? We asked her questions, got her to reflect on it repeatedly, and she was then able to collect those together into a higher way of seeing, and allowed her to turn around and say, hey, man, that was really a great state of mind, it's the best state of mind. Right. You had a dream. You have to say to yourself, by reflection, hey, you know, that experience I had of beauty was the most profound experience of beauty I've ever had. Yeah. How did you recognize that? By being asked questions about it, and you then had to put it into words. Yeah, I had to reflect on it. That's the activity of a seer, inviting, questioning, turning about, looking at oneself, seeing how the words match it. Yeah. Yeah, Miss, yes, what were you going to say? Well, I was thinking of Jeff's question, so then... Good. Go ahead. The dream invites that recursive activity rather than 
you know, dreams by themselves are messages. Mm -hmm. You're either going to decide to try to understand the messages or not. What's interesting about the kinds of questions that can bring you about, can bring about insight, are the kinds of questions that reflect upon yourself and what you are experiencing and what it means. Mm -hmm. Those three things put together as you see of understanding. Isn't the dream also... Oh, go ahead. I didn't have my hand up. Isn't the dream also... and that you see a reflection... Well, in the case of Belinda, and I think in the case of Eldar, they were... They, the dream was bringing them back to look at a moment of their actual life the day before, right? Absolutely. It was saying, don't let this go by, reflect on it, right? So I was thinking in that sense, isn't it, in many cases, perhaps not all, it is a reflection on some experience. Sometimes the highest experiences you did not even perceive, right? And your dream is bringing it back for you to look at again. Although, point taken, it's not in itself a set of questions. Yeah, so you got a great point. <clears throat> uh, like, what is the dream master? Mm. I could, Whatever fabricates the dream must have a startling understanding of what happened to you yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yes. And can put it in terms that if you then understand it, you gain an insight into your life. Mm -hmm. And may even uncover some early misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. what do you call that? What do you call the source of that? What's doing that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we're not in touch with it all the time unless we reflect on dreams yep. and daydreams. Yeah. Well, and it must it must choose the things that are important, so it kind of knows like the future of where you're going. Like, Absolutely, it's not like it just chose a random. Hey, thing. Remarkably, it sees it sees the telos of your choices or your states yeah. one way or another. Um, sometimes <clears throat> they call that the self. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to say that. Mm -hmm. For a while, we'll, we'll just say the dream master that covers it up. Well, <laughs> we have another dream. Oh, okay. oh God, some more yeah. questions first. Oh, are you just sure. saying that pretty much Lucia is actualization and potential from zero to one one hundred all at the same time, right? That's pretty what. It yeah, that's what you're doing. You're, you're using that language with that. <coughs> that's what that's what Plotinus is doing. He's using this kind of language with that mm. and trying so to reconcile. Mm. Okay. Okay. Do another dream. Okay. Good night. And by the way, now that you know how to get them, are you going to get another one? Be right back. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> She's going to say, you do it next time. <laughs> <laughs>